The second thing is that actually, if you are really thinking of a very Islamic point way, I mean, I mean, from a very Islamic perspective, is it really necessary that you build an Islamic union? Or is it better to have a Muslim country in the EU, which will influence EU with its own perspective? I mean, is it better to have an Islamic country in NATO than trying to establish an alternative to NATO? So what, what would you do when you establish an alternative to NATO? Will you go to war with NATO? Why is that for? Maybe it's better to have a, you know, Islamic presence there and in order to stand for Islamic rights there. So the modern world is a big system, and instead of trying to counter that system, you can be a part of that, and you can serve your morality, your ideals, your identity, maybe much better. So I, that's one argument that was put you know, uh, by the people who oppose Erbakan. So Erbakan never represented the majority of Turkish Muslims. The, 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 more, cons the more traditional and less radical groups like the Nur movement, it's a big movement in Turkey, the Nur coming from the Nur Sea line, and also Fethullah Gülen, who continues with the Nur movement. And they have schools all around the world, in London, and in, in, you know, very education movement based on Islamic ideals. These are very moderate groups in many ways, I mean, to use the term moderate. Uh, I mean, these groups did not like Arbakan's line because they thought that Arbakan is just creating troubles by all his harsh rhetoric. He's making the secularists more aggressive and creating problems. And actually, the headscarf ban uh, was a kind of reaction to Arbakan because Arbakan was saying the headscarves, the headscarf people are our soldiers in the, you know, not soldiers, but our people in the universities. They are the ones who represent us and so on. So he politicized headscarf a little bit. Then, then you had this reaction by the secularists. I mean, that reaction is crazy. I'm not trying to justify that. But, you know, there was one reason that Arbakan made this issue a kind of a political thing. Uh, so, but other Muslims, like the Nur and Gulen movement, they stayed away from that. And they continued to support the, not the diehard Islamists, but the more conservative and traditional line, like the Democrat Party and its continuation. And, for example, they supported Turgut Özal which was Turkey's president between 83 and 93, and which was really a big name in Turkey and changed many things. And he, he brought many freedoms, including religious freedom. So, uh, and at some point after the, you know, Arbakan came to power in 1997 for a year, and he again like tried, to, he used some rhetoric which provoked the army, and then the army just gave, gave, stepped in. I mean, it wasn't a real coup, but they called a soft coup or a postmodern coup. The army forced Arbakan to resign, and there was some purge. And then, uh, and that's a problem. Uh, that's a problem that Muslims realized. They said, well, when we speak about abolishing the secular system, when we target like making Turkey a part of the East instead of the West, we are to continuously attacked and suppressed by the secularists because the secularists think that if we give them freedom, they will be imposing on us. So it's a zero-sum game. I mean, it's a kind of thing. When you say about, hey, we will take the system and we will Islamize it, then you are always suppressed because peop the people on the other side, they don't want to be suppressed by you, and they're taking this preemptive war against you. I call it the preemptive in, uh, intolerance, the doctrine of preemptive intolerance. I mean, they won't allow you it, unless you guarantee that you will tolerate them when you, you're ro running the system. So it's a kind of a never-ending vicious cycle. So the moment that some of the people in Arbakan's party, including Prime Minister Erdogan and current President Abdullah Gül, they, the moment they realized that, they said that, well, instead of fighting with secular ideas instead of fighting with democracy and so on. Let's just be a part of it. Just, let's just make it more reasonable. Let's, let's uh, speak for a secular state instead of a secularist one. Let's just demand a neutral order. Let's just demand freedom for headscarf, but let's also say that we will respect the people without the headscarf. We will not try to abandon their, you know, suppress their life. We just want freedom for our people. So that line of thinking became dominant in this new line uh, in Arbakan's party, and that line became the AKP in 201. They just broke away from Arbakan's line, and they became the AKP. And that brought AKP support from all different groups. Again, secular liberals, Kurds, even Armenians in this election voted. Most Armenians voted for the AKP. Because Armenians said, that, I mean, we demand more religious freedom and more you know, secure, less nationalist Turkey, and AKP is bringing that. So 
the fact that they're getting votes from many non-Muslims, many agnostics, and so on, shows that they are really uh, bringing a system which will be good for everybody, not for just Muslims, but also for the Muslims, of course. So I think there's a key point there. Otherwise, otherwise people are always afraid of you. And there are still many uh, secular um, paranoiacs, you know, still afraid of AKP and its secret agenda and so on. But that, I mean, many people have gone beyond that point, and that's why AKP is appreciated also in the West. Uh, that, that is AKP. And in Turkey, the second political force is the CHP, Cumhuriyet Halk Partisi, which means Republicans People's Party. And it is the party of Atatürk. It was the party founded by Atatürk in 1923. It is still you know, run by Kemal, Kemalist principles. There are six Kemalist principles, like statism, secularism, nationalism, people, populism, and uh, revolutionism. Like Some of them are just don't mean anything at all. But secularism and nationalism are important things. And when, they, when the CHP speaks about secularism, they speak about imposing secular life on everybody. Just stop not allowing people to wear the headscarf in schools and public buildings, and diminishing the freedom for you know, religious tariqas and religious communities. In the face of that, AKP says, no, that's not secularism, that is secular tyranny. What we want is a free you know, society, like the one you have in the United States. And I think it is very symbolic that Erbakan's, Erbakan has, uh, sorry, Erdogan, Prime Minister Erdogan, he has two daughters. And they, are they have been educated in the University of Indiana in the United States. Of course, they wear the headscarf, and nobody says anything to them in the University of Indiana. But they would not be able to go to the University of Istanbul because it would not be allowed. Or, for example, when Prime Minister takes his wife to you know, uh, Washington or you know, Ireland or England, it's not a problem. Everybody shakes her hand, you know, welcomes her. You know, it's, uh, she has a headscarf. But in Turkey, our secularist president, uh, Cesar, which you know, left office six months ago, would not allow her in because she wears a headscarf. By seeing these comparisons, many people in AKP realize freedom is good. You know, if in a free society, you can do whatever you want. And the, the problem is the lack of freedom, not, not freedom itself. So CHP represents the old line of thinking, you know, suppression of Kurdish rights, Islamic rights, and all that. They want to, you know, create a very authoritarian state. They are against the EU process, for example. The CHP, I mean, not very openly against, but they're very critical of the EU process, and they want to be. They don't want the army's role to be diminished, for example, because the EU process demands that the army's role should be diminished. These are the two main political actors in Turkey. The third one, which is right now in the parliament, is the Nationalist Party. It's Nationalist Action Party. It represents Turkish nationalism. I mean, it's not Islamic, although it, it respects Islam to a certain degree because it's the fate of a Turkish people, but it's mainly defined by Turkishness. And it's not, it's not very open to Kurdish rights. Uh, and it will, you know, think that Turks, Turks are the best nation on earth and Turks have the best values and all that kind of crap. Uh, so, and they are, you know, they get support from the central, you know, Turkey, which is not very open to the world. And the, the people, the voters are generally recognized as not very well educated. And so it's like kind of Turkish uh, redneck culture, which, you know, so kind of support the National Action Party, to be frank. And there are other parties, like there's the Kurdish party right now, which gets 5% of the vote. And the Kurdish party is interesting because, uh, as I said, AKP got 55% of the Kurdish vote, which means that not all Kurds in Turkey are nationalists, and not all Kurds in Turkey are following a policy based on Kurdishness. The Kurdish nationalists, uh, which are in line with the PKK, the PKK is a terrorist organization, and to make a, sometimes people make a comparison with the IRA and Sinn Féin and the PKK and the, uh, the, well, I don't know how IRA is defined here in Ireland, so I don't want to be going into the details, but in Turkey, PKK is defined as a terrorist organization, and I do because they attack civilians and pretty bloody organizations.